Good morning, everyone. Welcome again to another one of our online services. It's great to have you with us wherever you're signing in from. I was gonna film from outside today because it's, it's a gorgeous morning out there, but the workmen were hard at it next door. And I thought having, all right, Jeff, can you pass the claw hammer? Might not be the best background noise to introducing the service. So I've moved inside, but giving you a slightly different scene. I reckon by 2020, you should be able to pretty much piece together the whole of my, my home. <laughs> but that's got nothing to do with this morning really in many ways. Actually this morning we're having um, quite a streamlined service because we've got our APCM happening immediately afterwards on Zoom at 11.30. For those of you who are thinking, should I know what that acronym, or if you're going to be pedantic, I think it's officially an initialism. Should I know what APCM means? It essentially means annual parochial church meeting and it's the Church of England's equivalent of a like a company AGM where we look at the accounts, look at various reports from different groups in the church, and essentially just do a bit of a stock take. So that's happening immediately after this service. So we're gonna keep it quite short and sweet this morning. But we are continuing our, our working our way through James, the book of James, um, gym class. And this morning we're looking at this idea of putting in the work. And it's not a call to become necessarily type A driven personalities, but Richard, Richard Ford is going to be walking us through this, this beautiful picture that James paints that says, actually, to be a Jesus follower, it's not just about signing up to a few statements of belief, kind of giving mental assent to some kind of doctrinal beliefs. Actually, there's something much more holistic and exciting going on there. And he paints this picture of a beautiful marriage between faith and activism. So that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. Before we begin, though, I'm just going to encourage us to, to pray. Um, I'm going to point us to a, one verse from Job. I was reflecting just before thinking about this, this introduction, just thinking, actually, oh, it's been quite a tough week when you look at the news and, and think of some of the events that have been going on, particularly in places like India and the impact of COVID. Um, and I guess for us as a church, we've, we've got some personal contacts out in India. And I know actually there's even a possibility that one or two of you may be watching this service right now. And for, for those of us who are activists, it's really hard to witness something that's going on in another part of the world and feeling like there's little that we can do. But we want to assure you and reassure you of our prayers and our ongoing prayers. And I hope this, this one verse from Job, it's Job chapter 12, provides you with a bit of encouragement as well. This is verse 10, and it simply says this, in his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of every human being. It's in his hand, so let's pray together as we start our service. Father, we wanna pray for our brothers and sisters in India and in other countries where the impact of COVID still seems to be massive. And we pray particularly for those who are ill and who may well be very fearful. We pray the truth of that verse may provide them with comfort and reassurance that you hold them in your hand. And we ask for you to extend your mercy, pour your protection over those people who are vulnerable. And Father, if there are things that we can do ways in which we can be active in our faith. We pray you'd show us what that looks like. So we commit ourselves to you this morning and we commit our brothers and sisters across the globe to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in, all his love for me. Yes, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, who is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes I am. Free at last, he has ransomed me, his grace 
runs deep While I was a slave to sin Jesus died for me Yes, He died for me Who the Son says free Oh, it's free indeed I'm a child of God Yes, I am I am chosen, not forsaken I am who you say I am You were for me, not against me I am who you say I am I am chosen, not forsaken I am who you say I am You were for me, not against me I am who you say I am Oh, I am who you say I am Oh, I am who you say I am who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am Who the sun sets free Is free indeed I'm a child of God Yes, I am In my Father's house There's a place for me I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Let's say the second verse free at last. Free at last, He has ransomed me. His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me Who the sun sets free Who oh, is free indeed I'm a child of God Yes, I am In my Father's house there's a place for me I'm a child of God Yes, I am Oh, I'm a child of God Yes, I am Hold me now in the hands that creates in the hands. Find me now where the grace runs as deep as your scars. You pulled me from the clay, set me on a rock, called me by your name. Made my heart whole again Lift it up And my knees know it's all for your glory I might stand With more reasons to sing than to fear You pulled me from the clay Set me on a rock Called me by your name And made my heart whole again 
here I stand, high and surrender. I need you now. I hold my heart now and forever. My soul cries out. Once I was broken, but you love my whole heart through. Sin has no hold on me, cause your grace holds me now. And that grace owns the ground where the grave did. For all my shame remains left for dead in your way. You crashed those age-old gates You left no stone unturned You stepped out of that grave And showed of me all the way Here I stand, high and surrender I need you now Hold my heart now and forever. My soul cries out. Once I was broken, but you love my whole heart through. Sin has no hold on me, because your grace holds me now. Healed and forgiven. Look where my chains are now Death has no hold on me Cause your grace holds me now yes. And that grace Holds the ground where the grave did Thank you for, for all my shame Remains left for dead in your way. You crashed those age old gates. You left no stone unturned. You stepped out of that grave and showed of me all the way. Here I stand, high and surrender. I need. Hold my heart now and forever. My soul cries out. Once I was broken, but you love my whole heart through. Sin has no hold on me, because your grace holds me now. Healed and forgiven. Look where my chains are now. Death has no hold on me. Cause your grace holds me now. 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 Healed and forgiven. Look where my chains are now. Death has no hold on me. Cause your grace holds that ground. Your grace holds that ground. Precious blood has left me forgiven Pure like the whitest of snow Powerful to make sin and shame retreat This covenant is making me whole So I will rise Lift my hand yes, for, for 
by His mercy my life was spared The highest name has set me free Because of Jesus my heart is clean Purify my heart in your presence Teach me to discover the joy Of holiness that falls as you draw me close In you what was lost is restored So I will rise and lift my hand by His mercy, my life was spared. The highest name has set me free. Because of Jesus, my heart is clean. Because of Jesus, my heart is clean. So I will rise. My head, for by his mercy, my life was spent. The highest name has set me free. Because of Jesus, my heart is clean. Because of Jesus, my heart. Today's reading is from the letter of James, chapter 2, verses 8 to 26. If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbour as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favouritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point, is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous 
by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Hello. Today we come to the fourth in our gym class series for sermons and the focus today is on putting in the work. And if you thought that John's talk last week was challenging, then you better switch off now. Because this time, James' teaching isn't just about attitudes. It may have an impact on your pocket and on your possessions. In just under 12 weeks time, the Tokyo Olympics are due to begin. And you don't need me to tell you how important the Olympics are to the athletes taking part. For some, it will be the pinnacle of their sporting career. For all, it will have been their focus for the last few months. Training and diets will have been carefully organised to ensure that each competitor will reach their peak performance just as the Games begin on July the 21st. They will truly have been putting in the work. St Paul, in his first letter to the church in Corinth, compares the Christian life to taking part in a race. Do you not know, he writes, that in a race the runners all compete, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win it. Athletes exercise self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable garland, but we, an imperishable one. So I do not run aimlessly, but I punish my body and enslave it, so that after proclaiming to others, I myself should not be disqualified. From Paul's letter, it's clear that those of us participating in the Christian race are in a much stronger position than what we might call ordinary athletes, since for them, there can only be one winner. Whereas for Christians, all who run the race successfully are winners. Moreover, we're also in a stronger position than those athletes preparing for Tokyo, for the corona pandemic means that there's no certainty that this year's Games will take place, whereas the event that we were celebrating a few weeks ago, Jesus' triumph over death through his resurrection, means that we can be sure that the goal for which we are aiming exists. But like those athletes, and like St Paul, and like those whom we might meet at the local gym, we need to put in the work. One of the noticeable things about this letter of James that we've been looking at for the last few weeks is that it does rather jump about. So in the middle of the passage which Sally was looking at a couple of weeks ago, under the heading Cool Down, we find a statement that is directly relevant to today's theme of putting in the work. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Then we find in today's passage, you see the person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. And as a body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds or works is dead. A couple of chapters further on in James' letter, he asserts, Anyone, then, who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Clearly, works or deeds in relation to faith are of prime importance to James and should be to us as well. But before we go on, we need to be sure of what we understand by faith in this context. James gives us a clue when he writes, You believe there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Behind this quotation, or behind this statement rather, lies a quotation from Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. 
So important in Judaism is this statement, known in Hebrew as Shema, that Jews are expected to recite it, both in the morning and at night. Immediately after the statement of belief, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, comes the call to action. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. To this Jesus added, love your neighbour as yourself. Faith for James as for Jesus, and it should also be the same for us, is belief in action. Not belief on its own. Not the kind of belief that when someone is required to say in a hospital, tick the box that represents their faith and ticks Christian, merely on the strength of, say, infant baptism. So it's faith that's divorced from action, which is James' target. As an example of faith and deeds working together, James turns to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 15, Abraham, although he and his childless wife are getting on in years, is promised by God that he will have offspring as numerous as the stars in the sky. Yet when they have but a single son, we're told in chapter 22 that Abraham understands that God, in order to test him, requires him to sacrifice this only son. Those of us who recoil in horror from such an appalling demand must remember that in Abraham's day, child sacrifice, as part of religious practice, was not unusual. James sees Abraham's readiness to conform to what he believes God is asking of him as his faith and actions working together and fulfilling the comment in chapter 15. Abraham believed God that he would have offspring as numerous as the stars in the sky, and it was credited to him as righteousness. But it's not just in such severe tests as this that we can see faith and deeds working together. In last week's reading, we heard James being critical of those who show favouritism to the rich and are insulting towards the poor. And today we hear that if you show favouritism, you sin and are convicted by the law of Moses as lawbreakers. Just after James has reminded us of Jesus' teaching, love your neighbour as yourself. One of the things that John drew our attention to last week was that Jesus didn't discriminate or show favouritism about whom he helped. He didn't require conversion on the part of the Roman centurion before he healed his servant, although he did comment upon his faith, and note that it was faith in action, action to have his servant healed. And although he had something of a sparring match with the Syrophoenician woman, he did heal her daughter. James also uses the way in which we respond to the needs of the poor as an example of the futility of faith without works. What good is it to say to a fellow Christian, or anyone else for that matter, lacking food and clothing, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, if you don't do something practical about it? In James' view, to fail in this way is to break the law that says, love your neighbour as yourself. And to break the law is to sin. Earlier, James encourages his readers to speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law. His reason for this is because he sees the law as encouraging us to be merciful to those in need. Should we fail in this, then we shall, James says, be subject to judgment without mercy. In other words, failure to link words to faith will have eternal consequences. Whereas mercy triumphs over judgment. God will be merciful on the day of judgment to those who are merciful to others. Now it may well be that we don't see in our fellow church members the kind of poverty to which James is referring. But it is there 
in the society in which we live. Margaret Kingman regularly publicises the needs of the Bromley Food Bank. One way of turning our faith into action, but not the only one. You may recall that Jesus gave a list of actions expected of his followers in the parable of the sheep and the goats. Feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, and don't be too limited in how you interpret this. Supporting the Bishop's Lent appeal for Zimbabwe, where our link diocese is involved in, dr in drilling boreholes to improve the supply of water, is a creative way of doing this. Providing for those in need of clothes, perhaps by donating those that you no longer have need of, say to the Bromley Refugee Centre, inviting in the stranger and visiting those in prison. A former Archbishop of Canterbury, William Temple, is on record as saying, the church is the only institution that exists primarily for the benefit of those who are not its members. It's quite a challenging statement, given how much time is devoted to meeting the needs of those who are its members. But its purpose is to remind us that the church came into being as a result of Jesus in all four Gospels, making it clear that the mission of the church, with a capital C, was to spread the good news of what God in Jesus had done for us. In Matthew's Gospel, we have the Great Commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. In Mark, it goes, Go into the world and preach the good news to all creation. In Luke, Jesus tells his disciples, and by implication us, that repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. You are witnesses of these things. John's Gospel is slightly different in that the call to mission is more personal. Jesus three times says to Peter, presumably as leader of the newly forming church, feed my lambs or sheep. In other words, take care of my people. And we know from elsewhere in John's Gospel, when Jesus refers to himself as the Good Shepherd, that when he refers to sheep, he isn't limiting the reference to his immediate followers. And John makes it very clear why he has written his Gospel. These things are written that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Tim Dearborn, in his book, Beyond Duty, A Passion for Christ, A Heart for Mission, writes, It's not the Church of God that has a mission in the world, but the God of mission who has a church in the world. In other words, the Church, that's you and me, exists principally to fulfil God's mission, as outlined at the end of the Gospels. Now let's unpack that a bit. The Lambeth Conference of 1988 identified what had become known as the Five Marks of Mission. To proclaim the good news of the Kingdom, to teach, baptise and nurture new believers, to respond to human need by loving service, to seek to transform unjust structures of society, to challenge violence of every kind, and to pursue peace and reconciliation to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the earth. These five marks are central to the Church's recently published A Vision for the Church of England in the 2020s, written by Stephen Cottrell, the Archbishop of York, and they've been helpfully abbreviated by the Methodist Church into five words. Tell, teach, tend, transform and treasure. Tell people the good news, teach new believers, tend those in need, transform social injustice, treasure 
the environment. I don't have time to go into each one in detail, and the first couple speak for themselves, but I think it would be good to look at the last two through the lens of James' teaching as examples of putting in the work. That's transforming social injustice and treasuring the environment. Christian Aid, in its publicity for the forthcoming Christian Aid Week, refers to the current climate crisis as one of the greatest injustices we face. That's because the principal culprits for global warming are the richer nations, whereas the principal victims are the poorer nations. The Archdeacon of Croydon, the Reverend Rosemary Mallet, writes, as part of this year's Christian Aid Week resources, that her awareness of climate change was sparked through studying, living and working in Senegal, Tanzania and Ethiopia early in her career, and seeing firsthand the ways the interests of corporations and global capitalism have exacerbated environmental damage and climate change and undermined and threatened the livelihoods and lives of local people. She then goes on to look at examples of the social injustice which we're called upon to transform. In Senegal, tomatoes were abundant, the staple of every market and every meal. And then, because of a development deal, cheap Spanish tomatoes were brought in and were part of a process that caused deep damage to local livelihoods and the national economy. The same issue was also obvious in Tanzania, where the cashew nut industry was hindered by the tide aid deals made to the deficit of local farmers. Then she turns to an example of the kind of activity that is damaging to the environment, a failure to treasure the environment. In Ethiopia, she witnessed the deforestation as trees were being cut down for charcoal. Our Archdeacon concludes, Even as Christians pray for the heavenly paradise, we are called to bring that kingdom into being in the here and now. We are called to build God's kingdom, to care for creation, and to work to transform any unjust and exploitative structures that harm the earth and its people. So another way of putting in the work to support the activities, another way of putting in the work is to support the activities that this church will be mounting as part of Christian Aid Week. <coughs> now I'm aware that there are lots of challenges in this sermon and I'm sure that God doesn't expect all of us to undertake everything that I've suggested. After all, Jesus did say, Anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. God remembers even small acts of kindness. But on the other hand, James makes it very clear that faith without works is dead. And who wants to be carrying a corpse around with them? Amen. Today's verses challenged me that Abraham was made righteous before God thanks to his deeds as well as his faith. His faith and actions worked for the same purpose, to obey and to glorify God. Lord, I really ask that this service that we've heard today would have really encouraged our faith, that in your goodness, in your presence, that you would be encouraging us to keep following you, to keep obeying you and to keep glorifying you. And as we meet at the APCM, Lord, we want our intentions for this coming year to really be focused towards um, obeying and glorifying you in our actions, in how we live out our lives as a church. And for each of us as individuals, um, I, I just want to encourage you to, to think of an area in your life where you just need God to step in and to encourage you in your faith. Lord, for me that was 
with work, um, yeah, you've been so good in showing me how faithful you are to me in providing employment. I thank you for that. I thank you for the continued evidence of your presence in my workplace. And I want to encourage you now to, to think of a, a situation where you know that you want to be really able to obey and glorify God. Lord, I want to glorify you in my friendships. Let me be um, a, a representative of you in my friendships. Would you give me that opportunity? Lord God, oh, there are so many um, situations around the world, further away, but also close by to us, where, where we need that combination of faith, knowing that you will come um, and respond to our prayers, but also where we see the desperate need for action. Lord God, help us to combine those two things, to have faith and to carry out actions, to carry out deeds that, yeah, that you would have us do, to obey you and to glorify you. Amen. By grace alone somehow I'll stand where even angels fear to tread Invited by redeeming love Before the throne of God above He pulls me close With nail-scarred hands Into His everlasting arms Condemnation grips my heart And Satan tempts me to despair I hear the voice that scatters me The great I am, the Lord is He Oh, praise the one who finds and shields my soul eternally Boldly I approach your throne Blameless now I'm running home By your blood I come Welcomed as your to the arms of majesty Behold the bright and risen sun More beauty than this world has known I'm face to face with love himself his perfect spotless righteousness Oh, a thousand years A thousand times Are not enough to sing your praise Oh, only I approach your throne Blameless now I'm running home By your blood I come Welcomed as your own Into the arms of majesty This is the art of celebration Knowing we're free from condemnation Oh, praise the one Praise the one Who made an end to all my sin For this is the art of celebration 
knowing we're free from condemnation. Oh, praise the one, praise the one who made an end to all my sin. Who made an end to all my sin? Who made an end to all my sin? Boldly I approach your throne. Blameless now I'm running home. By your blood I come, welcomed as your own, to the arms of majesty. Let's sing that again. Boldly I approach your throne. Boldly I approach your throne. Blameless now I'm running home. By your blood I come, welcomed as your own, into the arms of majesty, into the arms of majesty, oh, into the arms of majesty. Now I'm running home Cause by your blood I come We're welcomed as your own Into the arms of majesty Into the arms of our majesty Yes, Father. Yes, Father. Father, as we praise your name throughout this service this, this morning, help us to grip onto those words. We're welcomed as your own into the arms of our majesty. As I said at the beginning, it's a bit of a shortened service today, but we will be jumping onto Zoom at 11.30 immediately afterwards for our APCM. So if you're able to join us for that, it'll be great to see you. But just to finish up today, I was thinking of a verse, I think it's from Paul when he writes to the Ephesians in chapter two. And he says this, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And that feels just like a, a really neat summary of some of the things that we've been thinking about this morning. So let's just still ourselves as we as we sign off and let's pray together. Father, make it known to us what it means to be your workmanship, to know that actually you have stuff prepared beforehand for us to do, things for us to walk into that are about bringing your kingdom into this place. To help us to walk in the power of your spirit to do your will in jesus name amen take care one and all have a good week and catch you soon god bless